American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcast. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about how a Russian prince became known as the Apostle of the Alleghenies. It's an epic riches to rags story. Early in his life, this prince was in the middle of so much of what was going on in Europe at the end of the 18th century, and that was quite a bit. You're not kidding. Demetrius Golitsyn was born in The Hague in 1770. His father was a Russian prince who was ambassador to Holland at the time. His mother was the daughter of a German count who was a favored field marshal of the powerful King Frederick the Great of Prussia. His father was not religious, and his mother had been baptized and raised a pious Catholic, but she had lost her faith under the influence of some atheist acquaintances in France, including Voltaire. So Demetrius, or Mitri as he was called, was raised strictly shielded from all religious influences, even coming to hate all things Christian. But that's not to say he wasn't baptized. One must keep up appearances when one is in certain circles. Well, of course. Mitri's parents had him christened in the Russian Orthodox Church in the elaborate ceremony expected for a son of nobility. And just to name drop a little more in this story, his godmother was Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia. So he had great expectations. Yes, but more exciting than Dickens' version. Anyway, his life began to take that epic turn in 1786 when he was 16 and his mother came down with an illness that kept her in bed. She took up reading sacred scripture and was reconverted to the faith of her youth, returning to confession for the first time in many years, and finally receiving her first Holy Communion. At this point in the story, she basically became St. Monica and Mitri, her Augustine. It's interesting that you put it that way, because his mother's birth, marriage, and first communion all happened on the same date, August 28th, the memorial of St. Augustine. Right, it's almost like God had a plan or something. So his mother prayed and prodded and pressed Mitri to reconsider his hatred of Christianity, and finally he relented. About his own investigation of religion, he said, quote, I soon felt convinced of the necessity of investigating the different religious systems in order to find the true one. Although I was born a member of the Greek church, and although all my male relations, without exception, were either Greeks or Protestants, yet did I resolve to embrace that religion only which, upon impartial inquiry, should appear to me to be the pure religion of Jesus Christ. My choice fell upon the Catholic Church, unquote. He and his sister were received into the Catholic Church in 1787, and in honor of his mother, he took the name Augustine as his confirmation name. Thereafter, he wrote his name as Demetrius Augustine. In 1792, he was made aide-de-camp to an Austrian general, but shortly thereafter, the Austrian army dismissed all foreigners from service. So Prince Demetrius Augustine Galitzin no longer had a career. So, as was common for nobility at the time, his father suggested an overseas tour, including the Americas, and thus began the next phase of his epic life. And how. He set off from Europe in August of 1792, but he wanted to avoid the complications that came from being royalty abroad, so he took the pseudonym Augustine Schmet which in the United States became Augustine Smith. He also brought with him letters of formal introduction to the recently consecrated Bishop John Carroll of Baltimore. He landed in Baltimore in October of 1792, and after just a short time in the brand new United States of America, he was smitten. He was deeply moved by the needs of the faithful in this new country, and he resolved to pledge his life and his fortune to the salvation of souls in his new home. In short order, and very much against the wishes of his family back in Europe, He was accepted by Bishop Carroll as one of the first seminarians at the brand new St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore. St. Mary's had been established just the year before by Sulpician priests who had fled the bloodshed in revolutionary France. Three years later, in 1795, he was the second priest ordained in the United States and the first to receive all minor orders and ordination from tonsure to priesthood in this country. But in the U.S., he was still commonly known by his pseudonym, Augustine Smith. Yes, it was actually under this pseudonym that he became a naturalized American citizen in 1802, and under it that he conducted business, signed contracts, etc. However, Father Galitzin knew that eventually the issue of his name would pose major problems, so in 1809 he petitioned the Pennsylvania State Legislature to recognize and apply all legal status to his real name, Demetrius Augustine Galitzin. Wait, the Pennsylvania Legislature? 
Let's talk about how he ended up there. Well, after his ordination in 1795, he ministered in Baltimore, Northern Maryland, and Southern Pennsylvania. He was stationed at Sacred Heart Church in Conewago, Pennsylvania, when word came from McGuire's Settlement, a community about 150 miles west, that a dying Protestant woman wished to become Catholic before her death. Father Galitzin set off for McGuire's settlement. He arrived in time to instruct the woman in the faith, receive her into the church, and give her all the sacraments before she passed. And true to form, he once again found himself smitten by his new, even more desperate surroundings. Yes, indeed. He returned to Conewago, but immediately petitioned Bishop Carroll to let him relocate to McGuire's settlement and become pastor, basically to western Pennsylvania. Bishop Carroll agreed. So in 1799, Father Galitzin found himself with a new parish that included all or large parts of the modern-day dioceses of Pittsburgh, Erie, Greensburg, Altoona Johnstown, and Harrisburg. So the Russian prince had found his kingdom in the frontier of Pennsylvania. Now it was time to build it up. Yes, immediately he used his own money to buy a large tract of land near the settlement, and he set to work having a small church about 44 feet long by 25 feet wide, made of white oak logs built on a nearby hill. It was completed just in time for Midnight Mass in 1799. Nearby was a tiny house for him, 16 by 14 feet, plus a tiny detached kitchen and a stable. Soon he laid out a new town around his church and named it Loretto after the town of pilgrimage in Italy. People moved to Loretto and the church needed to be doubled in size. Eventually that was pulled down and a new one, twice as large again, was built. It was named in honor of St. Michael. Today the church that stands on that spot is the fourth church and it is known as St. Michael's Basilica. He began to travel throughout his parish, building churches, schools, and hospitals, as was typical, but also industry, gristmills, sawmills, tanneries. He wanted to allow his flock to flourish economically. He borrowed about $150,000 against his future inheritance. In today's money, that is more than $3.8 million of debt. But that staggering amount was only a fraction of what he anticipated he would receive as gifts and inherit from his royal family. But the tragedy was he never could collect on his expectations. No, since he had become Catholic and a priest, the Russian government had disinherited him from his father's estate. And though his sister had pledged to support him from her own wealth and inheritance, the German prince she married had debts of his own, which sucked up all of her money too. So no money was forthcoming from overseas. So now the prince, who never needed help, who never took a salary until the day he died, who supported orphans in industry, was forced to appeal to the public for donations to retire his personal debts. And pledges and loans did come in. The first name on the list of supporters was Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence and a cousin of the now deceased Archbishop John Carroll. Another significant supporter was one Cardinal Capillari, who later became Pope Gregory XVI. Perhaps the best loan was $5,000, from the Russian ambassador to the United States, who promptly used the promissory note to light a cigar. Smaller amounts came in from farmers and workers who benefited from his generosity and from the workers blazing the railroad through the Allegheny Mountains. By the time Prince Galitzin died, he had retired all of his debt, though it had prevented him from being named a bishop, even though his name came up for several seas. So here he was, a European prince, the child of fabulous wealth, living among and serving some of the most hard scrabble folks in the wilderness of Pennsylvania. I just love the contrast. He even had to put up a sign in the church that said, no spitting on the floor. Yeah, the sorts of men who would move to these rough mountains and valleys weren't exactly the genteel type. But indefatigable as he was in caring for his flock, construction of buildings, giving the sacraments, dealing with the uncouth laborers, that wasn't all that he did to build up the church in western Pennsylvania. He was also a strong defender of the faith. In 1816, a nearby Protestant clergyman gave a viciously anti-Catholic sermon, and in response, Father Galitzin penned a clear and compelling defense of the faith called A Defense of Catholic Principles in a Letter to a Protestant Minister. The letter was credited with many conversions, and in it, he said directly to that minister, quote, For God's sake, dear sir, if you value the glory of God and the salvation of your soul, give up protesting against the Catholic Church. In it alone, you will find salvation. Yes, but he wasn't one to speak ill of non-Catholics. At one point he wrote, quote, Whatever differences on points of doctrine may exist among the different denominations of Christians, all should be united in the bonds of charity, all should pray for one another, all should be willing to assist one another, and, where we are compelled to disapprove of our neighbor's doctrine, let our disapprobation fall upon his doctrine only, not upon his person. During the winter of 1840, Father Galitzin's health deteriorated, 
and the doctor recommended bed rest. Father Galitzin, now 69, refused to slow down, especially as Lent wore on and Holy Week and Easter approached. He said he preferred going on with my labors until I should collapse like an old worn out cart horse which is basically what happened. He died three weeks after Easter on May 6th, 1840, and was buried halfway between his rectory and his church in his own kingdom in Loretto, Pennsylvania. And in 2005, Father Demetrius Augustine, Prince Galitzin, was named a servant of God, putting him on the path to sainthood. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please be sure to give us a rating and a review. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on Twitter at sqpn. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. This is Dom Bettinelli, CEO of the StarQuest Production Network, with a special message seeking your support. StarQuest needs your help. Over the past year, we've grown by leaps and bounds. Every month, we produce dozens of shows covering numerous topics and all explore the intersection of faith and pop culture, which is the core of our mission. Some, like Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, are among the most popular shows StarQuest has ever produced in all its 13-year history. And our newest shows, like American Catholic History, are catching fire with new audiences. We're fulfilling our mission of evangelization in a whole new way, but that success is in danger. We must reach the financial break-even point if we're going to continue. Creating, editing, producing, distributing, and promoting a dozen shows have caused our expenses to rise and we are no longer making ends meet. We're rapidly eating through our reserves, and soon they'll be gone, and we'll have to cut back many of our shows. We might even have to shut down altogether. That's why it's crucial we hear from you right now. If you haven't yet become a supporter, please do so now. If you are a supporter, please prayerfully consider increasing your support at this time. Please visit sqpn.com slash give today and click the Become a Patron button to make your monthly pledge. Or to give a one-time gift, click the Donate button. When you become a patron, you'll have access to exclusive benefits and several special thank you gifts for supporting StarQuest at different levels. The need is urgent, so please go to sqpn.com slash give today. Thank you from all of us at StarQuest, and God bless you. May we hear from you today?